recording there and let me just see if it's going yes it's going so uh, from now on we'll be recorded so we are going to talk about Ephesians chapter 3 I think the previous sessions went very well uh, and uh, as I just preached through the book of Ephesians you know and got to Ephesians chapter 3 I just saw so much more of the love of God and uh, today we're gonna watch another clip that just um, explains more about the love of God and the grace of God and uh, Ephesians 3 just let me just give you a, a quick um, breakdown of what Ephesians 3 is all about Ephesians 3 is actually about a man called the Apostle Paul that is greatly concerned for the people that he really love out of the depth of his heart it's actually a testimony of a changed man uh, a man that went from Saul persecuting the church to Paul that loves the church so much that even when the church was uh, when he was in jail he was concerned about the well-being of people outside of jail many times we are concerned about the well-being of people inside jail but he was concerned about the well-being of his church you know outside of jail and he was in jail on account of preaching to the Ephesians and some other churches so they could have felt guilty and all of those things and uh, what then go, uh, what he then does what the apostle apostle Paul does is he presents the most powerful way by which we can actu actually have God's quality of life you know to us and I call that the grace of of love and that's also the title of the message today it's called the grace of love and he presents them with the grace of love um, as that which would bring him the Apostle Paul some peace uh, where he is in jail knowing that if this um, if the love of God can grab a hold of their hearts then he knows they will be under the influence of God's love they will be under the influence of God's grace and um, when they're under the influence of God's grace they are bound to have God's quality of life he actually goes so far to say that if they are under the influence of God's love then Christ will not just visit them in their heart it will not be like a one-time visitation in your belief where you believe grace for a period of time but you will actually settle down and abide and make his home in the hearts of these people in Ephesus so let us go to the um, to Ephesians chapter 1 and we're gonna read from verse 1 Ephesians chapter 1 and we're gonna read from verse 1 it says for this course verse 1 there for this course I Paul and a prisoner of Jesus Christ for you nations so what he's saying there is that for the cause of the grace message and preaching the Gentiles included into what Christ has done he's in jail um, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given um, to me words it's just a very difficult way of saying listen I'm in jail on account of preaching this grace to the Gentiles okay that by revelation he made known to me the mystery as I wrote before in a few words by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it is now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit that the nation should be follow heirs of the same body and partakers of the same promise in Christ through the gospel of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effectual working of his power now if you look at what he says there he basically says this listen guys let me explain something to you I'm in jail um, not because you guys have done something wrong not because you've accepted Christ that's not why I'm in jail you know I'm persecuted for preaching the gospel of grace not for you guys coming to the faith but for preaching the gospel of grace because you must realize that the Apostle Paul is now expressing his concern and just look at what what we can read between the lines here let's look at that he doesn't want he's concerned about them feeling guilty that he is now in jail on account of their faith and he doesn't want them to feel guilty because he knows that the moment you feel guilty 
they will be an open door for a guilt and condemnation and all those kind of things to grab a hold of, of your heart. And He doesn't want that. He wants them to be at a place of tranquility and a place of peace. So He is in jail and He's actually concerned about the people outside living in guilt. He doesn't want them to feel guilty. So uh, what he is actually saying, and I think what he's actually thinking of, is the Judaizers that would normally come in after he planted a church in a certain area, and then come in with legalism, and they could easily have spread a message and say, you know, Paul made a mistake, and he just said, all you Gentiles can just come the way you, the way you are, and that is why he's now in jail, and, and he actually made a mistake. The right thing is, you must obey the law, and just mix the law with grace. And Paul didn't want that, because he knew that would bring forth death, and that would actually make that which Christ has done, ineffective, or ineffective, in the here and now. Uh, you know, as a church, I want you guys to understand that the grace message starts with a reality. Then this reality is the theory about our life. This theory we hear, we believe, we get knowledge of it. And then as we get knowledge of this theory, uh, which I will explain in short, we find that our heart believes it. And then this belief in this theory manifests the original reality in our life so that we don't sit with a theory but a reality. Let me explain that. There's a, there's a reality that says there's a man in the Trinity. This man represents all of us. That is a reality. The theory is that the relationship that Jesus has with the Father is the same, is the platform from where we can now have a relationship with the Father. The theory is, which is also reality, that His innocence is my innocence. So that means the conclusion of that is that I can now come boldly. So um, because, of his in, because He's innocent, His innocence is ours. Because of his, righteous, his righteousness and because He's a human representing all of us, we stand righteous. So now there's a theory that says, the righteousness of Christ is a free gift to us, which is also a reality. The moment we get knowledge of that, it excites the mind. But as the mind gets excited about this, we find our hearts believe this truth. When we believe this truth, we find the righteousness of God give birth to a life equal to the reality of the holiness and righteousness in the life of Christ in our lives today. And that's what the Apostle Paul wants. He doesn't, I mean, his end goal is not for us to live a holy life. His end goal is not for us to live a righteous life. His end goal for us is to share in the righteousness of God and the holiness of God. And here we see that he's an apostle and this apostleship that he had was for this reason, to share the unsearchable riches of Christ amongst the Gentiles. So, uh, you know, there's, this verse can be understood wrongly and from there we can, um, you know, conclude doctrines like universalism or inclusionism, or all those kind of things. Uh, which, you know, I can understand why people can um, get to that point, you know, but there's certain things we might misunderstand, which I want you to look into today. The Apostle Paul came and this is what he explained. He explained that Jesus was the Messiah of the Jews, but that when the Messiah came, he was not actually the Messiah of the Jews, but the Messiah of all people, and that all people are included in what Christ has done. So when Christ came to the earth, and he became a human, and he obeyed, he didn't only obey on behalf of the Jews, but he obeyed on behalf of all people. He didn't only came to break slavery over the Jews, but slavery over mankind. For Jesus redefined slavery as being enslaved to the flesh and being enslaved to sin and being enslaved to death. And he came to break that slavery. For the slave master was the law, which finds its origin in what we do to have life. And the belief that says, I am what I do, I am what I possess, 
and all those kind of things. He said that Jesus did not exclude the Gentiles, but that he was the Messiah of all people. And we need to realize that the Apostle Paul clearly says in verse 5 and 6 that this was hidden from the old apostles and the, uh, I mean the, yeah, the, the, the prophets of old. It was hidden to the people of old. They didn't know that. But it was only made available as true knowledge 2,000 years ago. So, so it was actually a new truth to mankind, but an old truth to God. It was the original plan that God had from before time to include everybody in His quality of life. Now with that said, let's just read those verses again. For this course, I call them a, a prison. Oh, sorry, I want to read just from verse 5 there. Which in other ages was not made, uh, made known to the sons of man and is now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This is what was the mystery. This is the mystery. That the nation should be follow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. Now there's something very unique that I want you to look at here. He says that the nations, not just the Jews, but all people should be fellow heirs. Now that is amazing. That means that all people are fellow heirs of the promises of God. And not just fellow heirs of the promises of God, and that they would be of the same body and partakers of His promise in Christ through the gospel. Um, so what he is actually saying here, the nations are fellow heirs and of the same body as the body of Jesus. Now, that is amazing. The nations have been made fellow heirs of what Christ inherited. Remember, we are co-heirs with Christ. What Jesus inherited in His resurrection after He died and when He rose from the grave, when the Holy Spirit raised Him from the dead, He received a brand new life. And that's what we say, He inherited a brand new life. The life that He got after everything He did, the life Jesus got after everything He did, is the very life of God possessed in human flesh. That is the big thing that he inherited. Now, it says here in verse 6, and I read it again, it says that the nations should be fellow heirs. That means that in Christ, the human race became fellow heirs. They, we all inherited the very same thing as what Christ inherited. So, all of mankind... now. Please know, when I talk about the all, don't just label, you know, putting labels is just going to miss the whole thing. You know, I, and I want to just say this, maybe watching this for the first time, I'm not a universalist, I'm not a, you, you know, I, I don't believe all people are saved, but I do believe in just preaching the truth about what Christ has done so that people can believe the truth and through faith have access into this grace wherein the whole world already stands so that they might be saved. Right, so let us talk about this truth, this inclusive truth. This is the inclusive truth. Let's read verse 6 again. It says in verse 6, that the nations should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of His promise in Christ through the gospel, that the nations should be fellow heirs. So who inherited? The nations. What did we all inherit? We are now owners of God's quality of life. How do we have access to what we have inherited? By believing that this is what He's given us. How will people believe that this is what was given to them? They need to have the gospel preached to them so they can hear it and then when they hear it, they believe it. And as they believe it, they've got access to it. And it starts to shape and form their life. And they are then born of that truth because they believe. Now, let me explain faith quickly. We've made uh, such a big work of the doctrine of faith. You know, we faith for the scar. And if you don't have faith, then God can't do anything for you and all those kind of things. Now, last Sunday, I talked a little bit about faith. And I want to mention this again. Why did Paul talk so much about faith? And where 
is a document that, that God told him he must believe. Um, now, I don't know all the scriptures off by heart, but I don't think I know of any place where Jesus told Paul he must believe. I think what happened was that Jesus appeared to Paul. And when he appeared to Paul, he preached the gospel to Paul. And then when Paul believed the gospel, he found that he's got a brand new life. And then he reasoned, he reasoned in the following manner. He said, well, I found that this truth was always a truth. Jesus paid for the sin of the whole world. In what he did, he included Gentiles and Jews. This has always been a truth, you know. Jesus was already, uh, uh, he already rose from the dead. He was already at the right hand of the Father. And here was the Apostle Paul now, you know, years after that, persecuting the church. And he is an heir. The, the Apostle that persecutes the church is an heir of this salvation. But he does not see himself physically manifesting in his life saved from sins, saved from bitterness, saved from legalism. But when Jesus declared it unto him, and he then believed it, he found that the moment I believed this, I found that this truth has got this dynamic that when I believe it, it is animated in me and gives birth to life in me. And then he came. This is what I believe. He came with a message of, you know, if you believe then you will have access into this grace. That's where the whole thing comes from. So, uh, the Apostle Paul comes and he wants to preach something as already true, so that we can believe on a truth, so that people can be born from this truth. Let us read on. Uh, verse, verse 8. Let's read verse 7. Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effectual working of His power. Uh, now there's a lot to say about that. We will touch on it today. This grace is given to me who am less than the least of the saints to preach the gospel of the unsearchable riches of Christ amongst the nations. The word gospel means good news. This grace is given to me to preach the good news of what? Of the unsearchable riches of Christ amongst the Gentiles or amongst the nations. So what he's saying here is that the riches of Christ is now amongst all people. And to bring to light what is the fellowship of the mystery which from eternity has been hidden in God who created all things by Christ. So he says here that he wants to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ amongst the Gentiles and to bring to light, to reveal what is the fellowship of the mystery. In other words, what fellowship they have with this mystery, which is Christ as the Messiah of all people. Now, let us just have a look at the word fellowship there. The word fellowship, here's the meaning. Fellowship, association, community, communion, joint participation, or intercourse. Now, that is amazing. What Paul says is that his apostleship was to actually show the fellowship that all people have in this mystery and that nobody was excluded from what Christ has done. I say again, that doesn't mean everybody is saved. Everybody is saved from having the law as the only way unto salvation. I've said to Helena the other day in the car on the way to town, that um, what Jesus actually came to do is to change the way. When Adam sinned, he made works the only way wherein you could ever have eternal life. But Jesus Christ came, and, and let me put it this way, he made the only way unto eternal life, and you were bound to walk on that way. There was no other way. Then Jesus Christ came, and he made who He is available as the way unto the Father. And there is no other way unto the Father. We know that the way of the law looks as if it's a way unto life, but the end is death. But Jesus is the only way unto the Father. So should we believe in what is done, it's the only way wherein you are going to experience God as the Father of your joy, God as the Father of your holiness, God as the Father of your compassion. 
Amen. That is what he is saying there. Now, um, this is very important and I advise you guys to go and get this recording just later on today. Listen to it again and again, especially on this part. Because he wants to explain to us our fellowship. Our fellowship. Let's look at the, at the Greek there again of the word fellowship. It says there, association, community, communion, joint participation or intercourse. In other words, he says he actually wants to show your intercourse. Now, intercourse talks about absolute oneness. So let us make this our reality, church. God uses the word fellowship when he inspires the Apostle Paul to write this. I want you to know your perfect oneness, your perfect unity with what Christ has done. You have not been separated from this. This is what the Apostle Paul comes and what he shares with the people here. Now I want to, um, let, let us go and read on and just see how he explains the power of his love. We're going to read the verses and watch a short video quickly. Um, he, sh he says here in verse, um, I'm just going to use the normal King James here. I want to read from verse 13. He says, now he prays, he prays, he says, Wherefore I desire that you faint not at my tribulation for you, uh, which is your glory. So what he's saying, he says, guys, I want you to continue in the grace. Don't stop to believe this truth or be thrown off this truth because I'm going through hard times and you might think you might also be persecuted for this. For this cause I bow my knee. In other words, I don't want you to fall away. I don't want you to faint. I want you to stay in the good news. Now he prays and he's going to give us the key on how to stay in the gospel of grace and never fall from it. He says, For this course I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height, to know the love of Christ that passes knowledge that you might be filled with the fullness of God. Now, what he says there is, he says, I pray that God would grant you to be strengthened in the inner man through his glory. His glory is his goodness. So this is what he says. He says, I want God, and this is my prayer, that his goodness will strengthen your inner man to the point that Christ will dwell in your heart by faith. The context there is dwell and not just that it, will, that it will come for a while and then leave. It's not as if Christ would leave you, but I've seen it many times, you know, and sadly I see it, uh, you know, as even ministers just had Christ visit their belief for a while uh, because they didn't want him to make um, him, uh, uh, you know, a permanent resident. It's where grace comes and then they, the grace comes into the heart and you see Christ in the heart, but then they faint and the reason they faint is when they are uh, uh, confronted with how good God actually is. They are saying God cannot be that good. And because of that you find that it's not Christ leaving, it's but that they say, I don't want the goodness of God to continually dwell in my heart. But Paul says the only way you're going to have your heart strengthened to the point that Christ, that you will not faint at the gospel of Christ when persecution come or when hard times come or when you lose your job, that you will continue to believe the goodness of God, is by the goodness of God and observing the dimensions of his love. That is what he says, because love is influential. Love has got an influential power. Now, we're going to look at this following video clip, which is absolutely awesome. And then I'm going to explain the influence of God's love. What's up, guys? I'm Kobe from Model Pranksters. And I'm Justin. Today we're in New York City. We're going to go on the streets and find two homeless people, put them up to an arm. What's up guys, I'm Kobe from Model Pranksters. And I'm Justin. Today we're in New York City. We're gonna go on the streets and find two homeless people, put them up to an arm wrestle, 
The winner gets hundred dollars. Let's see what happens. Hey dude, how you doing? How's your day? Good afternoon. How's it? You didn't get so much money today. Yeah, I'm doing what I can. Working party pub job. It's like my own life. Slow day today? Yes, sir. What, what do you think if, uh, would you want to be part of a video where you can win a hundred dollars? Yes, sir. Maybe buy pants or something, yeah, like you never know. A new pair of pants. New pair of pants. Kobe, what's your name? Eric. Right your name. Hop right up. We got you. Let's go. This could help you out a lot. Homeless, I have no family. I live on the streets. God bless. How are you, dude? How are you today? Pretty crappy. All right, my name is Kobe. Is it a good day today or what? Uh, it's pretty crappy, man. Pretty crappy? Yeah. We're doing a video and you could possibly win $100. Do you want to do that today? Check it out. It probably could help you out. You never know. You could win. Okay, come with us. All right, this way. Yeah. And then there's other days where I just make $6 a day. I mean, Six dollars a day. Woo. Man. It's tough. It's true. It's tough. So we brought you guys here today. You have no clue what's going on, right? You just know you can win $100. Yeah. What's going on is actually you guys are going to be arm wrestling each other. Whoever wins takes all the money. Whoever doesn't win goes home empty handed. You guys ready for this? Let's do it. All right. All right. But wait, there's a cash though because even the loser is going to get $50. Okay, guys, we want a straight fight, clean, just no biting, no punching, straight arms. Ready? Five, four, three, two, and one. Oh, Aaron, Robert Scott, he's got a lead on this one. Robert going, Robert, 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 Robert's going. Aaron's coming back at it. Look at this, this is intense. Getting there, he's going and he wins. Takes the money, man. So like I promised, Aaron, $100 for you. Exactly what we said. Hope that goes somewhere with that. I have fallen get some uh, new set of pants. Robert? I know how it is, man. Working tough, no harm, no fall. How are we going to come Fair square, man. Come on, no harm, no fall. Be the needy, not the greedy, brother. Sir, sir. That's how that works. Trust what I'm telling you. That's my real dog. Wow, you guys, you guys don't know, you guys don't even know each other, right? No. This is like one of the most inspirational things I've ever seen because you guys, you, you just won $100, you gave it to him. You don't even know him and you were helping him when you don't even have a lot yourself. Honestly, you guys are amazing. Like, I do have another hundred. I want to give you another hundred dollar bill. Get more clothes. Get something. Take it, dude. You, you got. You're really like amazing, man. I hope, I hope you get. Just help yourself out, man. All right, Robert. You too. Take care. All right. Get yourself something to eat. Go stay in a hotel or something. Whatever you need to do. All right. Take care, guys. You guys are great. Stay safe, guys. Stay safe. Why well, isn't that absolutely awesome to just see that love? You know, this morning when I showed in church, we just saw so many people crying, and I'm sure this touches your heart. Now, the feeling that you get right there in your heart is what you call the grace of love. That feeling that says, man, this is awesome. This is so good. This is, it touches my heart. Now, that feeling is what I call the grace of love. And that was what the Apostle Paul was after. And he said, I want, I want your inner man to be strengthened with might by God being good to you. That the finished work of Christ may dwell in your heart. That you may actually not just have knowledge of the grace of God, but that you might be partakers of the grace of God. Um, you know, He wants you to partake of grace. He wants you to have grace as something that floods your heart, floods your mind, floods, um, you know, everything in your life that you can share in His quality of life. Now, what I'm after when we look at this, um, you know, this, this video clip was, um, when you look at, you know, the pranksters, uh, you know, they do these things and, you know, in this they are good to people but they also make them I'm, I'm sure they make money out of this um, but when you look at the one homeless guy share his hundred dollars you know he was not in a church where there was anything preached about tithing or giving or generosity or nothing he just felt these guys was good to me and then he looked at the guy on the other side me thinking that he's gonna go away with nothing his heart had to be overwhelmed and he shared he gave half of what he had to the other guy you know, so, and then when the, when the pranksters looked at this and they saw love, when they saw love 
and when they saw how good one guy is to another guy, that beholding that love, looking at it, looking at the glory of that one homeless guy, that is his glory, the glory of that man, that goodness shining forth in him. When they beheld that glory, what happened? It, it sh immediately shaped the prankster's life. You know, to say, I, I want to partake in this. And he took another hundred dollars and gave it. A hundred dollars to the one guy and a hundred dollars to the other guy. And beholding generosity influences the heart that generosity could dwell in the heart of the person that beholds it. And this is what the Apostle Paul is after here. The Apostle Paul is after the system that says, I want you to behold His glory. I want you to behold the glory of God. I pray that He may strengthen you through His glory in the inner man. In other words, beholding how God loves all people, how God included Jew and Gentile in His death, in His resurrection, in taking away the way of the law, how God included all people's sin. Because as we behold that, we will find that God will come and, and not just what is done and not just Christ himself living in our heart, but the very life of God will come and dwell inside us by the full persuasion of what we are beholding. And this is what the Apostle Paul says. He says, I want you to actually grab a hold of, with the purpose to make use of, the dimensions of the love of God, the full dimensions of everything that He has done for us, um, you know, and not just grab a hold of in an, our understanding, but, but the word comprehend, to grab a hold of with a purpose to make use of. I want you to experience what it is to love someone else. I want you to, um, to have the knowledge of what Christ has done by taking away your sin, but I also want who He is to dwell in your heart, in the core of your life, through a deep persuasion of beholding how much He loves you. You know, yesterday I, we went to, um, uh, 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 and I've got the diff difficult for me to say it in, um, in English, a choir, you know, we looked at some, some choirs, you know, uh, where six choirs, some of the best choirs in the world, were singing in Cape Town. And they had like 5,000 people there. It was a big thing, celebrating independence, and uh, not independence, uh, um, you know, the end of apartheid and those kind of things. So we went and we watched, um, looked at these choirs. And as I was looking at the crowd of people there, um, I noticed that my thoughts towards those people are beautiful. When I looked at the people singing there, I looked at them with an adoration, not on account of their beautiful voices. Um, the beautiful voices obviously touched me and just how everything flows together. It's like, oh my goodness, you know, this is awesome. But when I looked at man, I said to God, I said, God, I can understand why man uh, stimulates you intellectually and why man stimulates you emotionally. For we are the God kind. We are the God species. And when I was sitting there, I was fully persuaded of the forgiveness and the innocence of every person there. I wasn't fully persuaded that everybody knows it. But I was also persuaded the Father is speaking to the hearts of every person. I mean, one of the, one of the um, uh, uh, choir conductors came and he said, the song we're going to sing, and it was in a black language, I didn't understand the words, but he says, this was the meaning. This is the song the song's meaning, because of the blood of Jesus, we are safe. You know, because of the blood of Jesus, we are safe. And that touched the hearts of all people. And to me, it was the best song. And even the way it was done was just one of the best um, of the evening. Uh, you know, I was just overwhelmed by what I saw there. And this is what I believe God talks about where we can start to look at people the way God looks at people, where we feel that compassion and that embrace, where we are co-sharers, where Christ dwells in our hearts through the persuasion that we are forgiven, we are united with Him, the persuasion that uh, we are co-heirs of His quality of life. If we co-inherited what Christ inherited, you are co-heir of life, you are co-heir of righteousness, you're a co-heir of joy. You're a co-heir of peace, my friend. And I want to just tell you that as I preach this to you, um, 
uh, man, I, I feel overwhelmed. I feel, I want to thank you for watching this because inside me burns a passion to just share good news with somebody. And if I see that there are people watching this, it excites my heart because I can actually share this good news and just bring a smile to somebody's face in seeing him uh, having that joy. So, my, you know, and, and this is what happens as we start to dwell on the goodness of God and we behold God being good to us, but we also see how God is good to a sinner. Uh, one of my friends um, that visit me often, uh, uh, Jan Lambrecht, he's a, he's a plumber in town here, and he came to me and he said, you know, uh, he, he went to another church and uh, we've got this, uh, uh, we, we call the poiki course, you know, I don't know what it would be in English, but so we take a like a three-legged pot and you would um, cook food almost like a stew, but it's not a stew. You don't stir the thing, it's all packed in layers and the whole thing. And uh, there was a competition. He enrolled in this competition in a church and then somebody else came and, and he stirred the thing and broke all the rules of how you're actually supposed to prepare this food and then the other guy won the competition. And so I said to him, yes, it's exactly like grace, you know. It's like you break all the rules, but you win the prize. Uh, you, know, where we can, you know, where we can start to see just the goodness of God in every area of life, where we can see God being good to people. They don't qualify according to the law, but they qualify because of design. And they qualify because of the love that God has for people in their hearts. So, I want to end off with this. The Apostle Paul, concerned about the church in Ephesus, spoke th or shared the most powerful truth in how people can actually have life and life in abundance and have Christ dwell in them and have them actually um, make use of the dimensions of the love of God and so be filled with the fullness of God. This is what he says. He says, I pray that you may know uh, the love that's in Christ, that you may know how high, how wide, how deep, and how long the love of Christ is, so that you might be filled with the fullness of God. The fullness of God in your life experientially lies in this, to have a heart strengthened by the glory of God, the view and opinion that can be formed about who the Father really is, in what Jesus came to portray to us. Last Sunday I said it and I want to say it again. John said, no one has ever seen the Father, but Jesus declared Him. So Isaiah, Jeremiah, David, none of these guys have seen the Father for who He really was. Even Moses would say to you, God is a fire. But Jesus would declare to you, God as an Abba and show to us who the Father really is. And as we dwell in the view and opinion that can be formed about who the Father each is, portrayed by Jesus, which we define as the glory of God, the goodness of God, by including everybody in His death, including everybody in His obedience, and in His resurrection, make all people heirs um, of the quality of life He possessed, and giving all people the hope of salvation from physical death so that we, by faith, can have access to it and so be saved. When we see that, we find our lives strengthened where we can then become generous, born from God's generosity, where we can become love, born from God's love for us, where we love for He first loved us. Church, be encouraged. You are deeply loved. I would like to pray for you. Father, I want to thank you so much for your unconditional love. I want to thank you for your grace. I want to thank you for every person that has watched here. You know, maybe you are watching today and you feel deeply touched by the love of God. Um, I want to just look you in the eye and say to you that you are precious. Uh, God smiles over your life. He enjoys embracing you. Um, and you might say, Bertie, you know, it's the first time I've ever heard of this good news. What should I do about this good news? You can't do anything about it. If you want to do something, say this, say, Father, I turn my back on what I used to believe 
and I embrace this new belief. I believe on Jesus. And I'm not ashamed to say the name of God is written behind my name. I'm willing to be surnamed by God. I'm part of God's family. And as you call upon the name of the Lord, you will experience His life just giving new life to you. Uh, that is what you do. Let us pray together. Maybe you are watching this for the first time. I just really feel an unction to do this. Let us just accept the salvation that Christ has given us. Let us pray together. Pray these words with me. And just as a web church, just let's pray together as a family and just get the dynamics of this web family going. Father, I thank you for giving Jesus. Thank you that you have washed away my sins. Thank you that you embrace me. I receive my forgiveness. Your life is my life. I make use of the salvation you freely given. Your righteousness is my righteousness. Amen and amen. Thank you so much for watching, guys. Uh, it's such an honor for me to have you guys here. I would like to ask you if you want to be, if you could be so friendly, and when I post this um, on my Facebook page, would you please just write a short comment of what you think about the message? You might put a like as well. Uh, a comment just goes so much further. A little comment of what this message has meant to you. Um, we'll just get more and more people to watch this and slot into this. Not that the vision is for me to grow some, um, to grow the ministry, but we want to just see people that don't have a place uh, where they feel I belong. Just get to a place where they can enjoy the dynamics of God's love. Thank you so much and God bless you guys.